of our phone going and I'll do a record on here as well. Bing. Recording in progress. There we go. Name the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we give you the little pebble of our will in exchange for the gift of living in your most holy and divine will, Lord Jesus. We fuse ourselves into your will, Lord Jesus. Fusing into your will every thought, every breath, every word we speak every heartbeat, the flow of our blood, all of our memory, intellect and will. Mm. We fuse into your will every act of this night and of this day. We make an act of abandonment to your will, Lord Jesus, and an act of resignation to your will. Thank you, Blessed Mother, for all the graces of the divine will that you win for us. Thank you that you are the mediatrix of all graces and that every word, every breath, every heartbeat, everything we do, every single act is made eternal and infinite. And we thank you that everything we're doing in the divine world is bringing the era of peace ever closer. And I pray, Blessed Mother, for everyone who is watching this on Zoom tonight, here in the lounge, or who will ever see, watch this video, I pray that the outpouring of light into their soul will enable them to live ever more deeply in your divine will. Just have a moment of silence folks, I'm going to put my own microphone on mute, if you just be silent for a moment. Now Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace and Queen of the Divine Will, pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us, servant of God, Louisa de Beretta. Pray for us. Our patron saints. Pray for us. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Goodness. Welcome, everybody. What a beautiful turnout. Well done. Superb. Um, I'm going to begin tonight with um, initially looking at the book, of Do the book of Joshua. And then I'm going to go to Louisa. Uh, we're going to go to volume, so tonight volume 20, and we're going to look at the fight. Gloves off. So, Joshua, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, Moses, my servant is dead, now therefore arise. Go across this Jordan, across this Jordan, you and all these people, into the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Now I want to just point out, God is giving Israel the land. Now Israel have to do certain actions to secure the land, but the land is being given. So the victory is assured. All right, the victory is assured. It's it's in the eyes of God, the land belongs to. The people in the eyes of God it's merely got to be appropriated 
Okay, so the appropriation is what's going to take place. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you as I promised to Moses. And then God describes the land. He then goes on to say, From the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For you will cause these people to inherit the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Just be strong and of courageous. Be careful to do according to the law which my Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may have good success wherever you may go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you shall make your way prosperous and, ha and shall have success. So Israelite, Israel's task was to be obedient to the revelation that God had given them through the Torah. That was the task for the Israelites. God, for his part, would hand over the land and its inhabitants into Israel's power. So, in a traditional invasion, the people invading have to do battle with the occupants. And when they vanquish the occupants, then they can establish their religion. That's the way a traditional thing would go, right? Here, God has already established himself in the midst of Israel. And he's saying to Israel, just do what I tell you and I will hand the land over with all the occupants. Okay, now how is this working for us? Well, let me just take a pull of a good phrases for a few phrases for you, which I want you to take note of. Okay. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread, I will give to you, as I've promised Moses. All right. Be careful to do everything according to the law that you've been given. Now, I want to take the book of heaven and apply what Joshua has said to Louisa's writings. Okay. And I'm going for volume 20, 19th of February, 1927. I've just got to check on the room occupants to make sure everyone's still awake on this side of things over here. You're all still awake here. Okay. Because most of my congregation in this room is teenagers. Oh, thanks, <laughs> You're welcome, Anna. <laughs> so this is 19th of February, 1927. All right means it was written 97 years ago okay 97 years ago according to my math jesus invites louisa to fight that's the um headline okay the headline here which interesting enough really runs a parallel with what god is saying to joshua there's a commission to go in and do battle all right just as Jesus fights through his knowledges, through examples and through teachings, the soul fights by receiving them. And by following the acts of his will in creation and redemption. Okay, so I, as I speak these words out, your battle is within and you've got to learn how to receive these words to your interior. So this is Louisa, this is her diary excerpt, this is her writing. I was following my flight in the divine fiat and my sweet Jesus made himself seem coming out from my interior, braiding his hands together with mine, inviting me to fight with him. I was so very little and I did not feel capable and strong to fight with him. More so, 
since the voice came out from a light which said she is too little how can she win this fight okay um i bet you we can all pull our hands up and say yeah too little how am i going to win this fight against jesus yeah i'm just going to go back to the book of genesis Just take me a moment. Here we go. Uh, Jacob and he fights with God at the um, the at the border of the promised land. Jacob was left alone, and the man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with God. Jacob's name was later changed to here it is. Um, da, da, da. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Your name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have wrestled with God and with men and have prevailed. So Jacob was greatly blessed because he wrestled with God. Jesus is inviting us to wrestle with him. Just as he wrestled with Jacob, the patriarch. He's inviting us to wrestle. Louisa says, oh, Jesus says, it is exactly because she is little that she can win. Because all the strength is in littleness. Now that's going to have to be meditated on. Because when we prepare to enter into battle, the human tendency is to look to our strengths. Okay, that's the tendency. We want to find out our strong points. Now, anyone who is going into war will look at their strengths and their weaknesses. They'll say, well, where am I strong and where am I weak? So I can shore up the defences and I can fight from my main strength. That's not the way of the kingdom of God. Okay, Jesus teaches us that his power is made perfect in weakness not in strength and he tells Louise he tells the heavenly court that Louisa's greatest strength is in her littleness therefore our greatest strength is in our weakness and we need to ponder this mystery if we're going to progress by the way the progression and the battle is all within I just want to make note of that I should have mentioned that at the very start Joshua was invading a physical exterior land you are invading an interior land we must always remember that the kingdom we are conquering is within Louisa writes I was discouraged nor did I dare to fight with Jesus and he inciting me to fight you ever thought about that? Jesus inciting us to fight with him. This is extraordinary language, right? Jesus inciting us to do battle with him. He said, my daughter, courage, try. If you win, you will win the kingdom of my will. Nor should you stop because you are little. In fact, I have placed all the strength of created things at your disposal. So together with you fights all the strength contained in the heavens, in the sun, in the water, in the wind, in the sea. All of them wage battle against me. They do it with me to make me surrender the kingdom of the divine fiat. And they do it with the creatures with the weapons which each created thing has in its power to make them surrender into recognizing my will so that creatures may let it rain as they themselves let it rain wanting to win they all have placed themselves as though in order for battle 
and in seeing that the creatures resist, wanting to win by force, because they have with them the strength of that will which animates them and dominates them. With the weapons they possess, they knock down people and cities with such authority that no one can resist them. Now he's talking about the elements. When you think about the elements, only last week in, in America, they've had, I think, in excess of 300 tornadoes and townships have been completely destroyed because of the power of, of the wind. We know a little bit about what that can be like in England when entire towns are flooded. And you see it happening in Southeast Asia with typhoons. You cannot comprehend all of the strength and power that all the elements contain. It is such that if my will did not keep them restrained continuously, the battle would be so fierce that they would make a heap of the earth. Okay? So Jesus restrains the elements to preserve humankind. But listen to what he then says. The strength of the elements is also yours. Therefore, go around in their midst to put them in order for battle. This is Jesus' commission to you, what he's inviting you to do. To go around in the midst of, the na of nature and to put everything in order for battle in order to bring in the era of peace. And I'm going to once again say this. I've said this to you a few times. I'm saying it to everyone here. We're all still awake. <laughs> People talk about when will the era of peace begin. The era of peace begins when every child of the divine will has completed the tasks that God has assigned for them. So each one of you has got a certain amount of acts in the divine will that each of you has to complete before the divine will can reign. It is nothing to do with, will it happen in 2030? Will it happen in 2028, 2033? Will it happen in December 2026? Those dates are not relevant. Jesus makes that clear. He says the coming of the divine will is not to do with dates and times. It's to do with acts done in the divine will. And Jesus' most popular saying in the books of the divine will is, Be faithful and attentive. Be faithful and attentive. We are prevented from being faithful and attentive by the busyness of our lives. If you went back to a, if you, in fact, if you just went into a modern monastery or an enclosed convent, they are so faithful and attentive to the divine will in whatever way it expresses itself because their lives are lived at a slower, more contemplative pace. So they're constantly engaged in prayer. Our lives, we are under pressure to live fast and furious lives with all the communications that we have around us. And that is a big distraction from our journey in the divine will. This is one of the reasons why I always recommend people actually switch off their communication devices for a day a week or more if they can, so they can have an opportunity to tune in to God's will being manifest in their lives. Let me just get through the rest of this. If you do have any questions on route, folks, just put your hand up on Zoom and we'll take your questions as we go along. I don't want you to think that you have to wait for me to draw breath. You might be waiting a long time. Um, the 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 same rule applies for this lot in here. If you want to ask a question, if they ask, if they ask a question, you'll hear it on the laptop. I hope. Right. 
So, it is the will of Jesus that fights, that wages battle against his will for the triumph of his kingdom. So your fight is animated by the divine will, whose strength is sufficient and irresistible to win. Okay? Therefore, this is Jesus to you, please fight and you will win. Remember what he said to Joshua, everywhere you go, the land will be yours. He's saying the same to you, enter this fight and you will win. Let's take a look at what the fight is, because he explains it. To fight in order to win the kingdom of the supreme fiat is the holiest fight that can exist. It is the most just and rightful battle that can be fought. This is so true that my will itself, when it formed the creation, began this battle and this fight, and only then will it surrender when it wins completely. So, here is the fight. Do you want to know what you when you fight with me and I with you? So how, how does this fight look? I fight when I manifest to you the knowledges of my will. So Jesus, right now, is fighting with your soul. Because he's making manifest to you the knowledges of his will. And he's doing battle with your will, your ego, your fears, your anxieties, your warriors, your own perceived strength. Because remember, he said to Louisa, it's your littleness which will win. It's not your strength which will win. It's your weakness and your littleness which will win. He looks for weak souls, not strong. So his will is fighting this. His will is fighting the darkness in your soul. Because his will is light. His will is doing battle with the void in your soul. Because your soul is meant to be filled with a blinding light. Such that when you close your eyes and go to prayer, you will immediately encounter the blazing light of the three persons of the Trinity. That's what prayer should be like. Okay, but instead what happens is when we go to prayer, we enter into this dark void and we search for the quiet whisper of God's voice. We hunt for it and we're distracted by worries, anxieties, fears, doubts, meaningless thoughts, ideas and fantasies. All these things of the intellect and our human will are distracting us from God's voice in the soul. So God is con constantly battling with our fallen nature to draw us into the fullness of that which he has called us to. Remember Exodus 14, 14? I will fight for you. You have only to be still. Okay. Each saying... Each knowledge, each simile about my will is one fight and one battle that I make with you in order to, you, to win your will, to put it at its place created by us and to call it almost by fighting into the order of the kingdom of my divine will. And as I do it with you, in order to subdue your will, I start it in the midst of creatures. So Jesus is at the moment fighting with you, right now, in this very moment. And at the same time, because he has you and you are in the midst of the creatures, he's forming your, his kingdom around you in the midst of creatures because of you. This is why each one of you is so important 
in where you are in the divine will because everything that Jesus is doing for you with you and in you in the divine will he's also doing in everyone around you God never gives grace just for one person everything he's pouring into you is benefiting your family your friends and your enemies Oh, I got a wow from someone in the room. Everyone here is struck dumb. Yes, we are. <laughs> okay. I fight with you when I teach you the path which you must follow. Now, we've looked at that path many times. So I'll remind you, what is the path that we must follow? It is the path to interiority, to silence, to stillness, to interior peace, to a deeper union with God. It's the interior path of holiness, the path to beatitude on earth, the path to possession of the divine will. This is the path that Jesus has called you to. You know, when, when, when I read from Joshua, God said to Joshua, I have given you the land. That is it. And he, gave, he told him, from here to the Euphrates, from here to here, here to here. He told him, I've given this to you. Now, Jesus has given you the kingdom of the divine will. He has given it to you. What you need to learn to do is, how do I abandon myself completely so I can take possession of what Jesus has already given to me in his passion, in his death, in his resurrection? I fight with you when I teach you the path which you must follow, what you have to do in order to live in my kingdom, and the happiness, the joys you will possess. Why does he fight with us? Well, here's one example. When we are living in our flesh, we are looking at the joy, the false temporal joys of this world, the joy of having money in the bank, the joy of having a house, the joy of having a full stomach, the joy and the love of having possessions around us and goods, of materialism, relationships. But the true joy that, the, that you, each one of you, was created to have is the joy of fully living in the kingdom of the divine will. The joy of having the grace of beatitude. In your soul this is what you were created for you were not created for all the stuff around you you were created primarily for the kingdom of the divine will that's where your joy rests but we have to fight it even now as I'm talking this I can actually feel the resistance in people's souls because it's like the word is going out and it's not penetrating and I'm just going to say to you, you need to contemplatively receive these words this is why silence is so vitally important on this journey because silence enables us to receive into our soul the light that that word brings with it Contemplation is ultimately us being silent before God and receiving everything that God is pouring in. So when we learn to be silent, God can take that word which is proclaimed. I'll give you a word. I fight by dint of light which my knowledges contain. So Jesus right now is shining light into your soul and your soul is fighting against that light i'm getting nods thank you so much for those of you who are nodding because it's so important to recognize that this is a fight and that what we have to learn to do is to surrender and let jesus win now Good old Gerard has pulled his hand up. Good old faithful Gerard. <laughs> I can understand that the battle is that we are trying to battle with Jesus rather than against him. So 
the battles that we're trying to battle with. Yes. Yeah. Yes and no. You see, no, actually, if if you if you were to do a honest appraisal of the interior life, you would find that your battle is against Jesus. We like to think we're fighting with him, but actually we're fighting against him most of the time. If you were fighting with Jesus you would be in a state of beatitude. Yeah. What we have to realise is that our soul, as Jesus has explained, our soul is a huge void. And the reason it's a huge void is because of sin. That void is, if you look at the screens around you on there, most of the screens are black. All right. This is your soul. It's a void. It was meant to be blazing light. Your soul was meant to be the image of God who is light and in whom there is no darkness and there'd be no place in your soul where God was not. But there is, because there is the ego. There is the attachments to everything that is not of God. There is the um, selfishness. There is the, the attachment to sin. There could be sin in our soul and um, the pursuit of pleasure. All these things are in opposition to Jesus. So with all these things in our soul, we are fighting against Jesus, not for him and not with him. We're fighting against him. We also have fear, anxiety, fear of what Jesus might ask of me, wounds from the past, bad memories of the past. We've got all these things that need to be purified and cleansed. And the knowledges of Jesus are constantly pushing against these things, bringing light, bringing healing, bringing transformation. Which is why we have to honestly appraise ourselves and, and recognize if I truly wanted to be 100% holy, I would be. There would be no arguments. Okay? If I truly, honestly wanted the grace of beatitude, and was ready to surrender and give up absolutely everything to attain it, I would get it. And I've heard this not this is not from me. I've heard this from many experts on the spiritual life over the years. You know, um, from Cistercian monks to saints of the church. You know, it's 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 very it's a very simple thing. We wrestle with God, we are like Jacob, we wrestle with God constantly. There's only one person in human history who did not wrestle with God, and that was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Well, even she says, every moment of every day she had to put her will to death. She had to sacrifice her human will every moment of every day so that the divine will could reign in her. And she said she suffered the greatest martyrdom in that respect. I'll keep going. So I fight by dint of light, which my knowledge is contained. I fight by dint of love and by the most touching examples in such a way that you cannot resist my fight. I fight by means of promises of endless happiness and joy. My, my fight is persistent. Nor do I ever become tired, but to win what? your will and in yours and this is a real amazing punchline folks this is the amazing punchline so i fight to win your will and in yours those who will recognize mine in order to live in my kingdom so within your will there are those who will recognize Christ's will to live in his kingdom. So you have to say, okay, who is in my will? Your spouses, your children, your friends, your enemies, all these people around you who you wish to live in the divine will. They are in you. And Jesus says this, right? I'll repeat it again. 
my fight is resistance, nor do I become tired, but to win what? To win your will and in yours, those who will recognize mine in order to live in my kingdom. And you fight with me, with me, not for me, with me, when you receive my knowledges and placing them in order in your soul. You form the kingdom of my supreme fiat in you and fighting against me, you try to win my kingdom. It's interesting language, isn't it? Very interesting language. I just repeat, by the way, in case you're sort of thinking, I want to find this reading. Volume 20, <laughs> okay. 19th of February, 1927, right? Each one of your acts done in my will is a fight that you make with me. In each round you do through all created things to unite yourself to all the acts my will does in all creation, you call all creation to wage battle in order to win my kingdom, moving my will, dominating in all created things, to wage battle against my will to establish its kingdom. This is why in these times, the wind, the water, the sea, the earth, the heavens are all in motion more than ever, waging a battle against the creatures as new phenomena occur. And how many more will occur destroying people and cities? Because in battles it is necessary to dispose oneself to suffer losses, and many times also on the part of the winner. Okay, so... I ask you, Dick, there's a question. Are you disposed to suffer losses in this battle? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody want to know what sort of losses? Go on, Ellie. Ego. Thank you, my wifey. No, my wifey just said the ego. Go on, Ellie. question as well. Fire away. Yeah. So it's like, um, do you know I gave an example of, of the fight and how Jacob was fighting um, God. So God or effect, angel, effectively God, um, comes Jacob to help to become him weak and putting out his hip out. Um, so but it's the same. So it's a lot of hope for us because God is interested for us to fight and to be weaker and he will come and help but how do we so do you think he comes to our weaknesses and and gets like very individually and we need to recognize that as self-knowledge brilliant that weakness which he puts us out brilliant or is there like you know for all of us the same room the same kind of like weakness well, every single one of us is different. Even if, even if, let's just say, you and I were both struggling with anxieties. If we examine them, we both find that they're very different but similar. Okay? So, every human soul is created in the image and likeness of God, which suggests that we're all the same, because we're all created in His image and likeness. But every single one of us is slightly different in the, mean, in the way that the soul looks, the way we are. So we've all got differences, but we've all got similarities. Now, if you go to our weaknesses, um, your weaknesses, this is kind of like the teaching on self-knowledge, your weaknesses are most perfectly displayed in the people you do not like. Or in the behaviours of people that you don't like. So for example, you might, let's just say, um, uh, you have somebody who's a friend at work. and Sorry, somebody you like is a friend, but they do things that annoy you or they do things that you criticize or that you don't like to observe and so on. That is God showing you that there is something in you that you do not like. Okay, now that's self-knowledge. That is the classical teaching on self-knowledge. All right, it's not a Derek theory. That's just a classical teaching on self-knowledge, that when we see a behaviour in somebody else that we do not like, 
It's merely revealing to us something in us that we do not like. Okay? That means that there is a weakness in us that we are not reconciled to. Because the important thing with self-knowledge is it's not something that is necessarily sinful. Oh, thank you, Gerard. What if that behavior is sinful? Again, you who are without sin throw the first stone. You see, let's just say a person has a weakness which is, let's say, lust is your weakness. Now, lust is not sinful if you do not act upon it. The weakness is in the soul. You recognize you have a weakness in the soul, be it lust, pride, avarice, greed, whatever. You recognize the weakness. You learn to love the weakness because you recognize that actually Christ has redeemed the weakness. And therefore God's power rests upon you because you're not giving life to the weakness, but you have reconciled it through confession, for example. And then God can heal that wound, but you recognize it's there. Now, I'll give you an example of this from the church fathers. One of the early church fathers um, was known for his purity. He was a monk, an old monk in his 70s and 80s. And um, he had people who would go to visit him to receive counsel. And he was known for the purity of his counsel. Now, when he, this is, he's in his 80s, right? He's renowned for his purity. So you'd think he's a safe bet. But he wrote in his, in his writings, he said, he fell into a grave sin. A sin against purity. Consequently, he repents, goes to confession, repents, he's restored to grace. And he recognizes that the fall into impurity was in itself a grace because it enabled him to be purified of the pride he personally felt over his own purity. Yeah, so the sin itself eventually because he sinned and repented is redeemed and he recognized he wasn't as pure as he thought he was and therefore the weakness became a strength yeah this is this is a this is the journey we all have to go on we need to learn to confront our weaknesses to not be scared of them and to reconcile them and to be to love our weakness this is our battle and what 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 jesus is, is trying to do with us is the battle of self-knowledge he's trying to teach us self-knowledge through the behavior of other people and our wrestling matches jesus is saying to us this is what you're like and we're saying to jesus i would never be like that <laughs> and jesus is saying but it's exactly what you're like and we're saying no i'm not i'm nothing like that I would never be so proud, arrogant, and everything else, vain, etc. But Jesus is saying all the time, look, everything you see in another person that you can criticize is a weakness in your soul. Now there's a knowledge which brings light to the soul. And there's a fight which takes place. Self-knowledge and humility are two of the most important things that you can experience on the spiritual life. Two of the most, way beyond any perceived visions, consolations, words from God in inverted commas. I know lots of people who might have experiences of dreams and visions, and they might have experiences of God's touch and God's holiness and so on. Self-love is more important. No, self-love, no. self-knowledge. <laughs> that the rooms here self-knowledge is more important and humility because on the wings of self-knowledge and humility you can fly all the way to the grace of beatitude i haven't finished this um this uh, chapter yet by the way so i'll keep going but please if you do have any questions just chip in all right yeah, feel free oh we got a, we got a question from someone in the room um so say you've got a problem with anger how do you love that in yourself? Do okay. You struggle with it so much? If you have a problem with anger, 
How do you love the anger that you have? Good question. Let's apply the same rule as with lust. All right. So I get angry. I know I've got anger in my soul. I know it's probably the cause of a wound. Anger is often caused by a wound deep in the soul. But also there can be a righteous anger. Okay. So what do we fight it with? What is the antidote to anger? Peace. Yeah. Perhaps. Love. Peace. Yeah. So what we have to do is we, we have to focus on um, how to grow in peace. The anger is still there and we love so the steps to the steps to, to, to reconciling the anger step one recognize the weakness okay step one recognizing your weakness step two being reconciled to your weakness so rather than saying to Jesus all the time if only I didn't have this problem, I would be a much happier person. I'd be super duper holy. Okay. Reconcile yourself to the weakness. Remember, St. Paul said three times I asked the Lord to remove this thorn from my side. So Paul had to reconcile to the weakness. Okay. Step three. So one, recognize it. Two, be reconciled to it. Three, integrate it. Integrate it. So recognize I have anger in my soul, but I'm not going to give life to it. So you integrate it. I have it. It is there, but I'm not going to give life to it. Step four, I love it. Because Jesus has redeemed it. Jesus died for me and has saved me from this sin. Now this is where the salvation of Christ doesn't just become a... Sometimes salvation is like, oh yeah, I made Jesus my Lord and Saviour in February 1991. Yeah? So it's like... 30 odd years ago I made Jesus my Lord and Saviour. Well what about making Jesus Lord and Saviour every moment of every day at the deepest core of your being in the deepest darkest wound in your soul? That is salvation. The fact that you need to be saved every moment of every day. Then you have salvation. Okay. You put your hand up again Ellie. Oh, my wife likes that. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry again. But, um, yes, so I'm just wondering, because someone asked about that anger issues, and because uh, I had similar things with um, apathy, sloth, uh, that sort of thing. So, but I really, I haven't made it perfectly, but I'm just re re discovering it now. So, but I applied uh, St. Ignatius 14 rules on it, and it really worked. Take that me through that again. The Saint Ignatius, what? Sorry. Saint Ignatius, fourteen rules. So is it twelve rules? That's all oh, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Of course. You know, this is yeah. ge these writings are genius. Um, I was also going to suggest that recognizing that looking at virtue. Okay. All too often, when we're looking at virtue, we're thinking about. Um, living the virtue out in such a way that we're never going to fall, we're never going to fail. Well, actually, the life of virtue is a battle. And virtue itself, um, for example, um, let's, say the, let's say the virtue of patience, the one that everyone laughs about. The virtue of patience is only exercised when you feel impatient. All right? You have to battle. So patience isn't really being exercised if you're not feeling impatient. <laughs> it's like it's like any exercise. If I was a if I was a weight trainer, okay, if well I am, you know. So. 
<laughs> but if I was a if I was an avid weightlifter, and I'm on my bench doing this all the time, let's just say I do ten, and I sit up and think, all right, I'm done. Now I'm not sweating. I'm not working. I'm not really exercising. I'm not going to improve myself. I'm not going to grow. You grow when you get to the point of failure. That's exercise. That is proper exercise. When you get to the point where you're going to fail. Now, this is really, really important with the practice of virtue because we often will try to live a virtuous life on our own strength. And we have to learn to live a virtuous life in God's power, not our power. The word virtue actually means power. And in the Divine Will Writings, Jesus says that it is his virtue that must be alive in the soul, not my virtue, his virtue. And therefore it is his power, his, it is his purity, his patience. When was Jesus patient? Was it when he was nursing at our lady's breast or was it when he was dying on the cross waiting for death to take him you see it's easy to be patient when everything is good but the virtue is exercised when you're at your limit so purity of heart is easy for me to exercise here and now sitting in front of you but what about if I was in a brothel and I had to say, right, I can't look and I can't do anything. I've, I'm pure. I'm given over to God. Then the virtue is being exercised. Don't go into a brothel, by the way. <laughs> it's just a purely metaphorical, probably not a good metaphor, but that's just a, <laughs> that's just a, a way of putting it, all right? Now, I'm going to keep on with Louisa's diet. I'm going to watch my time a little bit. Um, if there are any questions or thoughts you want to chip in with people, please feel free. Um, here we go. Um, Therefore, I fight with you and you fight with me. So this is where Jesus is giving us a knowledge on his divine will for our interior life. Remember the prophet Isaiah says, I will lead the blind in a way that they do not, uh, do not know. Now Jesus is revealing to you. Don't forget, he, he revealed this to Louisa and Lisa was in a state of beatitude. So he, he's revealing to you that you do not cooperate with him, you fight with him. And he fights with you. And that's a really important point to get. He fights with you, you fight with him. All right? This fight is necessary for you in order to win my kingdom and for him in order to win your will and to begin the battle in the midst of creatures, so as to establish the kingdom of the supreme will. I have my will, with all its very power, strength and immensity in order to win. You have my will, and all the creation and all the good I did in redemption at your disposal. So look at that. Jesus is your redeemer. Can I ask you the question? Are you taking the goods of redemption and appropriating them in every moment of your life? Or are you trying to live your life every day by your own perceived strength? See, Jesus has placed all of the goods of redemption at your disposal. Are you applying them? It's the application, the appropriation of the goods of salvation and redemption, the appropriation of the divine will, which will enable us to grow in holiness. If we're trying to do it by our own efforts all the time, the only thing that's going to grow is pride. Each word, so this is to Louisa, each word you write is also a fight you make against me. One more soldier that joins the army which must win the kingdom of my will. Therefore, his last line to you, be attentive. Now he writes to Louisa, be attentive my daughter. Well I say to you, be attentive children of the divine will. 
because these are times of fighting and it is necessary to use all means in order to win. Now what did I say to you a few minutes ago? You have the goods of redemption at your disposal. You have the goods of salvation at your disposal. You have the sacraments, confession, the Eucharist. You have your acts in the divine will. You have the divine will itself, God's own will, the heavenly court. You have the whole of creation, all the elements at your disposal. Are you using the goods at your disposal or are you willfully trying to do this by your own efforts? I'm going to ask you to ponder that over the next week. This is your homework, okay? Your homework for the next week is, am I really applying the goods that Jesus is offering me in the divine will? Or am I trying by my own effort? Am I, in, am I integrating my weaknesses or am I leaning on my strength? Ponder that. Really ponder it quite deeply because it's only when we take things into the very depth of our soul that we encounter the truth about ourselves. If we just think about these on a shallow human level, we're not going to really gain anything from it. We need to let these truths penetrate deeper. We need to go into the very the worst part of who we are for the redemption to really take effect. The worst part of who we are. And the worst part of who we are is often revealed in the people we least like. Or the behaviours of the people we least like. Thank you. Quite often you might be married to that very person. <laughs> yes, I know, you might be laughing, but... <laughs> God often puts us with a spouse who will teach us self-knowledge. Um, Eileen, I saw your lips move, but I didn't hear anything. <laughs> I think I know what you said. Was that a uh, hear, hear? <laughs> any, any last questions, folks, before I uh, go do the final prayer? Anything anybody wants to chip in? Okay, we've got a question from a teenager in the room, so brace yourselves, folks. Go on, Jim. Um, so what, would you, what do you do to like, not do it in God's strength? So, like, how do you go throughout the day doing it in God's strength? Okay, how do we go throughout the day doing things in God's strength? Just give me one moment, Sheila. We'll answer Jim's question. How do we do things throughout the day in God's strength? Okay. This is actually very, very simple. It's not easy, but it is incredibly simple. All right? The rules are very simple. You begin your day with the prevenient, prevenient act in the divine will. Jesus, I place everything of this day into your will. Before you do any important task, like for example, you might be writing an important email. You say, Jesus wants to do this, so I'm gonna do it with Jesus. That means the divine will reigns in that act. As you're doing your acts, you're speaking, you're drinking, you're walking, Come divine will, speak in my speaking, walk in my walking, listen in my listening. Then you're doing your rounds in the divine will. So this is where in everything you're doing like this, your human will is put at rest and the divine will is operative, which means you're doing everything in God's power. Okay, so it's simple. Now, I say it's not easy because your sinful nature is going to be like a pressure cooker wanting to explode and to be given life that's the battle and the more we absorb the knowledges of the divine will the more effective we will be at letting that slowly rest taking the heat off it if you like because the only way to deal with a pressure cooker is either to lift the lid or to turn off the heat okay and i don't know about you guys but I'm not a big fan on lifting the lid off my sinful life. I'd much rather just turn the heat off. <laughs> Sheila, did you ask a question? 
Yeah, uh, yes, it's actually, yeah. I was wondering if you could repeat the homework assignment. I didn't write it down well. <laughs> okay, she did no I problem. Know, I, and then I lose them. <laughs> no problem. I'll see if I can repeat it. If I don't get it exactly right, I'm sure somebody will remind me. So the homework okay. assignment, the homework assignment is an exercise in self-knowledge. It's to take a good, honest look at your interior life in the depths of your soul, especially into your your weaknesses and the the wounds, the woundedness, um, and to bring in Christ's salvation and redemption into those weaknesses. And it's to look around you at the people around you and the things that make you annoyed, the things that make you angry, the things that you criticize and condemn in other people, recognizing yourself in their behaviors and instead of criticizing and judging other people learning to recognize that behavior in yourself and then starting to integrate it so that you can be at peace within yourself now i hope i kind of got the homework the same in both circumstances Oh, okay, so Anna's just reminded me. Appropriating, good one, appropriating all the goods of redemption and salvation and all the goods of the divine will. So when we do this exercise, we do something very simple, like um, Jesus wants to um, look interiorly, so I'm going to look interiorly with Jesus. Come divine will, come gaze in my gazing. I'm going to take a good look within. Uh, let me just see, Gerard's got a question. So, let's just say, so Gerard's written, what if, that, what if you see something sin, sinful within us? Listen, the whole, the whole, when you go to confession, what you're meant to do before you go to confession is look inside and ask God to reveal your secret sin. You know, it's from the Psalms, I think it's around Psalm 46. Reveal to me my secret sin, my hidden sin. Only God can reveal those sins to us, which is why when you go to confession, you need to have a sit down and an examination and say, okay, God, I can see there's something sinful in me. Now, Bear this in mind, sinfulness within you only becomes sin when you act upon it. You have to remember that. When you look inside yourself, you might see lust, you might see pride, you might see narcissism, you might see hatred. You see, you might feel hatred towards somebody. It's not a sin if you're not acting on it. Sin is only sin when you actually take action. It's good to confess the corrupt nature that's going on inside you. It's good to bring it to confession. But it's very important to recognise that if you haven't done anything hateful, then you haven't committed a hateful sin. Yeah? But if you don't do it, then... If you don't do it, you haven't sinned. <laughs> Yes, thank you. That came from one of the young members of the group over here. Okay, Joe, I'm going to start charging you. <laughs> no, it wasn't quite what I meant. So I've got a kind of an example. Um, I go to this club and I go to this club and there's people there that are often using Jesus' name uh, like a swear word. And it's that, obviously, it's what you're talking about, that annoys me. I don't know what that's saying about me, but I'm trying to tell them not to say that. So should I just keep the quiet? That's what I am. Well, whether you're going to challenge is people or keep... That that, is, it, is that something just that annoys me? Is that saying something about me? Just okay, so in, um, in the teaching on the interior life regarding growth in holiness this is Teresa of Avila and commentators on Teresa of Avila say as we're progressing 
let's say we're in the third mansion of prayer and God is trying to draw us into a deeper mystical experience of prayer often one of the obstacles to growing into that deeper interiority is our self-judgment on other people whether they're doing right or wrong is irrelevant it's our judgment this is why I tell people that we must not criticize Pope Francis lots of people love to criticize him and seem to revel in it forgive me for my um, language there but the criticism of other individuals and the judgment of them is incredibly destructive to the interior life incredibly we have got one vocation one commandment that Jesus gave us which was to love one another to love your enemies that's that's the commandment so criticizing and sitting in judgment on other people is preventing us from growing in holiness and this is why you know when I talked in this session about we are fighting with Christ constantly Christ made it clear do not judge lest you be judged so when we judge other people we're fighting we're fighting against God straight away Jesus gave us one commandment love one another if anything and love your enemies if we are not loving everyone without excuse without boundaries if we're not loving everybody we're fighting against Jesus against him now this is so clear in the writings of the saints and mystics our problem is we're surrounded by so much garbage on all these internet blogs that we think it's okay for us to behave like those people it is not when you read the writings of the saints on the spiritual life the church fathers and everyone else they are totally for the teachings of Jesus you do not judge you do not criticize you do not condemn you do not behave like this you love 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 and you people are the end time saints you're called to love above everything else more than anything else and criticizing and condemnation and everything else judging other people to, uh, Sister Anne Le Leslie Lund puts it marvellously she says um, we know we are growing interiorly when we are no longer scandalised by the behaviour of other people because we will recognise that the scandalous things we see in other people's lives are the scandalous things in our soul so we will no longer be scandalised by them now these are the hurdles people of God so you might be thinking to yourself, gosh, I'm always criticizing, I'm always judging people. How do I get over this? How do you think? By God's power at work in you. Recognize your weakness. Start to integrate it. Recognize it, integrate it, start to love it. And you'll start to love that behavior in other people as well. And eventually... When you're sitting in a pub and you've got all the people saying the name of Jesus in vain, the presence of God upon you will be so powerful that they will be convicted by your presence, not by anything you have to say. Because you will carry God into the pub. St. Francis of Assisi used to say, everywhere you go, preach the gospel and occasionally you might have to say something. There's a reason for him saying that because everywhere he went he carried the presence of God now we clearly do not do that otherwise we wouldn't have all these issues around us so we need to get to that place in the interior life where we are carrying God wherever we go yeah let me say a prayer to finish with guys and it's going to be an echo of what we've been teaching tonight all right and I'd just like to say thank you as well for your attentiveness, for you coming on to the, this, this video. Really appreciate your presence here tonight. Thank you so much. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus, you want to pray. So I'm going to pray with you, Lord Jesus. So Lord, I pray for everyone here tonight. 
both present in this room and on this Zoom call and those who watch this video. Beginning Lord Jesus, I ask you to be their Lord and Saviour. Teach them about how much you have truly saved them. And it wasn't just to set you free from sin. That was the beginning. Jesus saved you to raise you to the very heights. Jesus has completely redeemed you, every part of your being, from the most evil deep depths of your soul to the greatest heights of your virtue. Everything is redeemed. So Jesus, I just ask you to pour out your glory upon every one of them. The heavy weight of your glorious presence. divine will breathe in our breathing think in our thinking pray in our praying beat in our heartbeat and Lord Jesus I just on behalf of everyone here and those who will watch the recording, I just place every act of this day in your will, every act of this night in your will, so that your kingdom will reign in everything we do this night. All for the glory of the Father. Thank you, dearest Mother Mary, Queen of the Divine Will, for pouring out that beautiful fire into all of our hearts, setting us ablaze for the kingdom. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Jesus, we thank you for the glory of your divine will. Thank you, blessed Mother. For all the graces of the divine will thank you louisa that you're interceding for us and that you're with us thank you saint hannibal de francia for your intercession and saint joseph i ask you as our father in the divine will i ask you to please teach us not just exterior silence but teach us interior silence and lead us in this era and the father the son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your presence here tonight. God bless you all. Thank you, Derek. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless BL. Thank you. Bye. Bless you. Bye, Good night, Mark. Uh, good Bye. night, Martin. Thank Francis, you. thank you very much, Chap. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> That's a sweet. Uh, thank you. God bless Patty. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Bless you, Sharon. God bless. Bye, thank Thanks, you. Liz. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, Rosaline. Right, I'll end it there. Good night, folks. God bless Sheila. Take care. <laughs> Bye. God bless Maria. Thanks, you bet. Recording.